Lucy. I'm Jennifer Toms. I work for Archaeology Scotland and I edit our annual journal Discovery and Excavation in Scotland or DES to its friends. This year's volume which I'm launching today covers all this DES covers archaeological work carried out in 2022 and it contains a great range of interesting material and fascinating discoveries from Shetland to the Scottish borders and from the Western Isles to Fife. The type of work reported on ranges from developer funded watching briefs and evaluations through historic building surveys and recording to full scale excavation. We also publish post excavation results and photogrammetry. We welcome reports from community groups and university and other researchers. For example, the National Trust for Scotland are regular contributors. The COVID pandemic, of course, had a considerable effect on the level of archaeological activity carried out over 2020 and also 2021. But happily, in 2022, we seen a resurgence in the number of projects carried out, in particular an increase in research and community work. So a wide range of interesting finds and we're particularly long chronological range this year of an artefact from the early Mesolithic Magdalmosian culture, radiocarbon date to the mid 9th millennium BC, been found on Isla by Steve Mythen at a site which I'm not even going to pronounce attempt to pronounce. I uh, don't want to offend any Gaelic speakers that we might have. We also have a report on Kenny Brophy's work on the Garden F Glasgow Garden Festival, which was held in 1988. Work continues at Mesolithic Deeside, a splendid community project that involves many people and has produced a, produces consistently good results and lots of flints. Those pictured are just the ones from just one spit in one test pit. The dangers involved in digging up flint are clear from the photograph above as well. National Museums of Scotland publish all their treasure trove finds in DES, often with photographs. Among other notable finds in the 2022 volume was a forged French coin, an Ecu d'Or, of Francis I, dating to between 1519 and 1547, found in St Andrews by metal detectorist. I don't have a photograph of it, so instead I've got some shiny gold ring found at Kirkton of Craig in Angus. Staying in Angus, we have the relatively unusual phenomenon of a quarry excavation that was the focus of the excavation was the actual quarry itself and its associated buildings. Rather than the more usual case of archaeological work being undertaken in case there are important things within the area about to be quarried, as we saw earlier this morning with the Hindford Quarry roundhouses. The quarry at Slade Farm, Carmyle, dates from at least 1806 and the sandstone produced there was known as Arbroath Paving. Of further interest is the fact that Slade Farm is the site of two quarrying breakthroughs, the invention of both a stone planing machine and then later a cutting machine. And the photo shows the stone working building with its boiler chimney. I came into archaeology as a prehistorian, but in the three years I've been editing DES, I found myself increasingly fascinated by the post medieval remains that are abundant all over rural Scotland particularly in the uplands of the Highlands and Islands and Argyll. They survive as a testimony to the years of hard work put in by ordinary crofting folk to eke a living out of often hostile soils and dreadful weather. There are things like stone clearns, cairns and the inappropriately named lazy beds remind us, remain as relics of these times as do small croft houses, outbuildings and hillside shielings. Every volume of DES has reports of surveys of these sites, notably carried out by Claire Ellis uh, of Argyll Archaeology and Stephen Burke of West Coast Archaeology Services, as well as many others. The site here is Olistat on Isla, and it may have Norse origins, going by the place name, 
and it was first documented in 1541 and then seems to have fallen into disrepair, shall we say, by the time of the OS mapping in the late 19th century. Eventually a sheepfold was built over the remains of the buildings, as you can see on the top photograph. Archaeological evidence of the replacing of humans with sheep in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. Of course, these people displaced had to go somewhere. We know lots of went to, famously went to the States and Canada, but others moved to cities and, an, and into an environment which must have seemed just as foreign to them as the New World. Overcrowding and resulting disease and squalor in Edinburgh, for example, led to the building of the new town and the rebuilding of the old town in the 18th and 19th centuries. The soils and other deposits excavated through this building work were dumped in the middle of what had been the Norloch, just north of the High Street, and just down the road from here. This top picture shows these deposits, the dump deposits. And the excavation is believed to be the first investigation into the deposits that make up the mound. And it found that they could be characterised as well-ordered dumps of material cast from the east side of the mound and sloping from east to west. The pattern of deposition and the lack of material culture other than in the demolition layers indicated a well-ordered controlled depositional process, a theory backed up by the lack of general household waste and midden material, which indicates that the area was not used as a general dump. Of course, the mound then formed an important link between the old and new towns, as it still does, and no other practical routes across the city existed. Second photograph is of the turntable at St Margaret's Railway Depot, the largest railway depot in Edinburgh between 1845 and 1967. There may have been over 200 steam locomotives housed there and it was a hugely busy industrial site employing a large number of people with the maintenance of locomotives and building of trucks and carriages. It was probably a big contributor to Edinburgh's reputation as Old Reeky. Perhaps one respite for these crofters seeking out their living from the land was their ability to create whisky. In the last few issues of DES have had many examples of illicit stills, typically small buildings, wholly or partially concealed and located near a water source. This example, excavated by the National Trust for Scotland at Applecross, had a malt drying kiln built over a hearth and with a flue on its southeast side. The second photo is just one of many beautiful photos that Stephen Birch submits every year with a post-medieval building against a scenic highland background. The survey was carried out in advance of woodland planting. And so to Orkney. And the nows of Swandrow on Rousey, a brock site which is eroding into the sea. Excavation has been going on since 2010 and resumed last year after a two-year gap caused by the pandemic. Among other exciting results, the 2022 season revealed evidence of the deliberate demolition of the central roundhouse and the lowering of the outer walls by stone robbing. The midden ceiling these events had been excavated in previous years and contained artefacts strongly indicative of Viking culture. Does this suggest that the demolition events relates to the arrival of the Scandinavian people. The lower photograph is the nest of Brodgar, where excavations resumed, returned to full capacity in 2022. And there's a long and interesting report within the volume 23 and a colour photograph on the back cover of a very beautiful piece of Neolithic wall. Finally, the Western Isles and more problematic Gaelic names. Simon Davis and the US Community Archaeology Group have contributed to, to DES for many years. Like many of other community groups and non-professional archaeologists, they do a great job of surveying and recording ordinary sites and buildings which would otherwise be overlooked as they're not threatened by development. This volume of DES contains four reports from Simon. The pictures are from his survey of the Nunton to Grimmish right of way, which passes the first free Church of Scotland building. The all-pervading sheep are here shown on the footpath. The final photo shows the results of a survey of coastal features on part of Uist with the 
lower photos showing the newly discovered sites. And this final slide is to remind us all that DES is not just the reports of recent archaeological fieldwork, which is what takes up most of my time, but also contains annual roundups from National Museum Scotland and Historic Environment Scotland. We also publish a list of postgraduate research being carried out on Scottish archaeological topics in UK universities, a list of all contributors to DES and the contact details, and areas of responsibility of the Scottish Local Authority archaeologists. Finally, I'd like to just thank all the contributors to this year's DES and all of you for listening. And I have missed out many, many exciting sites. I apologise if, <laughs> for those of you who have submitted very good stuff that I wasn't able to include in this whirlwind tour of a year in Scottish archaeology. If you're a member of Archaeology Scotland who subscribes to DES, you can pick up your copy from me at the table at the back now or throughout the afternoon. Or alternatively, you could buy a copy or you can sign up with us for Archaeology Scotland membership. Thank you. <laughs>